Okay, I think we can <coughs> get started again. So, uh, any questions occur to you during the break? All right, so <coughs> before the break, we discussed some of the chemistry. I'm not going to go into it in much more detail. Uh, the bottom line is, though, here's that term we've been discussing, and uh, we're interested in um, making it <coughs> uh, compatible with the rest of the CFD solution, and we don't want to spend all of the time on the combustion uh, simulation part. So we've been looking at uh, ways of speeding up the chemistry solution, and uh, Federico Perini is a postdoc at the Engine Research Center, has been exploring uh, analytical Jacobian solution techniques uh, using sparse matrix um, methods. Uh, what he noted is that, you know, if you look at this uh, map here, which basically uh, tells you the uh, species number and reaction, uh, well, in this case it would be this, the species I versus species J, uh, space, you can see that when you have relatively small number of species, 47, there's quite a dense population here. A lot of it lies on this diagonal, uh, which of course is that species with itself. But you know, if you look at a reaction, most species involve just one other, one other species as reactants. So this is a very uh, structured arrangement. And when you get to very large mechanisms with 3,000, 2,800 species, the matrix, this Jacobian matrix, is pretty much sparse uh, or not populated. And it's 99% sparse. So you can use sparse matrix solution techniques uh, to, to essentially construct the Jacobian matrix uh, and then use uh, preconditioning and various other tools to evaluate uh, the, the, the matrix. And what he has shown is that it's possible to essentially create a solution technique that scales linearly with the number of species. If you compare that with the uh, traditional method, uh, it's an N cubed, which made it much more difficult to uh, use in a practical application. So here's an example that shows the traditional um, standard approach for solving the matrix problem, uh, which basically scales as the number of uh, species cubed. And here's his method uh, that scales linearly. So we've implemented this in a uh, tool called SpeedChem, which is also available on the Engine Research Center website. And it's now used by all of our students, basically. Uh, and they're seeing ter terrific speed up, um, three to 10 times uh, for relatively small mechanisms um, as well. <clears throat> the other thing that uh, is embodied in his speed cam uh, and builds on previous work um, by uh, former student Long Liang uh, is this adaptive mechanism clustering idea. So if you look at your combustion chamber and you look in a, a small region here, you'll see that the cells in this region are actually thermodynamically quite similar, or perhaps they are, depending on the, what you define as similar. So instead of sending each of these cells to your chemistry package, you can combine them in some way and basically send a group of cells together and then unpack them when you get back the results. So basically you would send that to your, your uh, clustering algorithm, solve it perhaps with ChemKin or with SpeedChem, and then remap the solution back to the uh, physical domain. Um, so this is actually a, an extremely powerful technique for, slowing, for speeding up what would have been slow chemistry. Uh, and it's especially important or beneficial if you had a more or less homogeneous mixture, like in HCCI, because then you only have to do relatively few chemistry calculations, and yet you can still define the whole uh, grid. The other idea is uh, something that Long Liang has looked at, which is this extended dynamic adaptive chemistry idea, where basically you have your reaction steps, and you notice that certain of the reactions are just not participating. For example, uh, all of those ignition reaction steps are not important when the main combustion event has already taken place. So why are you still solving those reaction steps? 
So he has developed a technique where you basically uh, dynamically determine which reactions need to be considered and you adjust the number of reactions um, accordingly. So this just shows some examples of the use of those speed-up techniques uh, where we used, in this case, a, a version of the PRF mechanism with 39 species and 140 reactions to solve uh, an HCCI engine uh, simulation case. We had experimental data. Here's the pressure trace versus crank angle. Uh, shown in black is the experiment. If we did the simulation with the full 39 species uh, making the well stirred reactor assumption in each computational cell. It took about two days to do the simulation. With the adaptive chemistry, it was done by an order of magnitude. So just a couple of hours, four hours. And then by adding this, uh, uh, the, the final step of eliminating unimportant reactions, uh, you can further reduce that. So this allows you to do way more research uh, because you don't have to wait two days to get one result. Right? So it's very helpful uh, to uh, in introduce these types of simulations, simplifications, and still get uh, very close results. Okay, so I want to move on now to discuss spark ignition engine combustion uh, modeling. And in particular, uh, we'd already discussed this morning that flame propagation is going to be uh, something to consider. So here's just a picture of an engine with a spark plug, a side-minded spark plug in this case. Uh, we ignite the mixture, and this purple region you see here, pink region, is a flame that propagates across the combustion chamber. Uh, we need to model the turbulent flame. And the way that we do it at the Engine Research Center is to introduce a technique, a level set method called the G equation, I'll tell you about in a minute which basically tracks this interface between unburnt and burnt mixture. Uh, it incorporates both laminar and turbulent flame speeds, uh, and it also is responsible for the burning, basically, of the charge. Uh, but it can account for flame quench. So, for example, if you have regions in the combustion chamber that are too dilute for uh, effective combustion, the model switches off and the flame is quenched. Uh, the model also accounts for post-flame chemistry, so we have detailed chemistry occurring both ahead of and behind the flame. Uh, so this makes sure that you get the correct uh, CO oxidation and uh, unburned hydrocarbon oxidation, and also pollutant formation. And I mentioned uh, chemistry is active also ahead of the flame. This allows you to look at knocking combustion or auto-ignition, and also locate where it's where it's actually taking place. So one of the questions that I, I mentioned earlier was, what is a turbulent flame? All right, and there's been a lot of research done on turbulent flames. Uh, this is uh, a picture I got from Professor Law, was probably taken across the street, uh, which shows a the developing turbulent flame. You can see it's a very irregular uh, boundary here, and there's a lot of evidence of structure inside the, this envelope of uh, low-density gas that's uh, already burnt gas. And conceptually, if you blow up a region of this flame, you see that it's comprised of laminar flamelets. Uh, and you could kind of even draw a continuous line here. There's regions where the flamelet is quenched because of high stretch and so on. But the, essentially, the idea is that a turbulent flame is a, laminar, a set of laminar flames where basically you take the laminar flame speed and you sum it over each of these flamelet areas and divide by the turbulent flame or the evident turbulent flame uh, area. And you can see that this enhances the laminar flame speed considerably. So the concept is to think of a turbulent flame brush that consists of laminar flames that's propagating at this enhanced velocity. All right, so the turbulent flame itself, um, what are the length scales involved? <coughs> well, um, Professor Gandhi's group at the Engine Research Center has uh, used a very high resolution PIV to make measurements of the length scales uh, in an engine. And uh, basically, the Kolmogorov length scale or the Bachelor length scale, if you're dealing with scalars, 
uh, scales with the Reynolds number of the flow to the minus three quarters and the integral length scale. And these are measurements that he has uh, produced that show that the, at near top dead center, this is just in the turbulent flow without combustion, the length scales for mixing are on the order of 20 uh, microns, which, by the way, is on the order of the laminar flame thickness under these conditions. So basically, you're in a regime where the flame thickness is quite similar to the minimum scales of mixing in a turbulent flow. And so if you look at uh, combustion regime diagrams, the Bogey diagram or uh, Peter's version here, which plots the turbulent velocity and the laminar flame speed uh, against the length scale of the turbulence and the laminar flame thickness, you see there are these regimes where you can have basically uh, for low length scales quenched uh, reaction zones that just uh, uh, you cannot support combustion, the flamelet uh, zones, and then zones here where basically the turbulence just wrinkles a uh, laminar flame. And if you look at where engine flames are located, they're pretty much located in this region here uh, that I alluded to earlier in this flamelet regime. So one of the things that you can monitor in your simulation uh, is the uh, length scale of the turbulence, if you have a, turbulent, uh, a turbulence model, uh, and compare that turbulence with the laminar flame thickness. Uh, and if you s reach a point where the turbulent length scales become small compared to the laminar flame thickness, you can argue that your flame is likely to be quenched. So this is something that we introduce in some of the models where we uh, uh, argue that if your uh, flame becomes quenched, you set the turbulent velocity to zero. The main point, though, of this slide is that you have to realize that it's not possible to resolve a turbulent flame, fully resolve a turbulent flame, on a practical engine simulation grid. So just think of an engine, or an engine maybe 10 centimeters bore, this is like an automotive engine, uh, it's not practical to have a uh, resolution less than around a millimeter. So we're talking two orders of magnitude just in one dimension. Since it's 3D, you've got to cube that. So you would need at least a million grid points to get down to a millimeter size mesh. And we're discussing 20 micrometers here. So essentially, it's just not practical to try to model the details of a laminar flame particularly because you need to have several, maybe as many as 10 grid points across the flame if you actually want to get the flame speed calculated correctly. So that makes modeling flames in engines quite complex. So again, it's useful to go back and look at a sample or a, a sort of a prototype uh, flame analysis, that Millard Le Chatelier analysis that I spoke about earlier. And let's just review laminar flames. Okay, so laminar flame you can show that the governing equations for species, mass fraction, and energy can be written like I've shown here. You notice the difference between these and the ones I spoke about earlier is that now I include uh, diffusion terms or gradients uh, in the calculation. And the reason I need to do that is because the flame has structure, right? And I need to know the slope of this uh, temperature gradient or whatever it is that I'm monitoring. So the flame speed from Millard Le Chatelier analysis is proportional to the diffusivity times the species consumption rate, some measure of the species consum consumption rate. So if we go back to that single component system that I described before, you can represent these equations with a single ordinary differential equation that has a diffusion term and a reaction term. It's called a reaction diffusion equation. Again, U here could be uh, either the species uh, mass fractions or the temperature. Here I'm just showing it in terms of temperature like we did before. And here's that same source term that I discussed before for the reaction rate. Uh, that goes to zero when you're in the unburnt mixture and also zero in the burnt mixture when U is equal to one. Turns out there's a, there's a solution, a traveling wave solution to this uh, ordinary differential equation, uh, sorry, partial differential equation, 
that uh, admits a steady traveling wave <coughs> that travels along a line with slope s, the, the flame speed, the slope of the line dx dt equals s. And it's given by this uh, exponential function here um, as uh, a function of this uh, reduced variable x minus st for steady propagation. And in this case, the predicted flame speed, just like Millard and Le Chatelier predicted uh, a century ago, is the square root of the diffusivity, that's this guy here, times beta, which is basically a ma the magnitude of the reaction rate, normalized by what your choice is for this exponent m here. Also, the thickness of the flame depends on the diffusivity and the flame speed. So this is the physics that has to be resolved if you want to actually calculate a propagating flame uh, as seen by this example problem. Uh, the diffusivity and the reaction rate are required right, to calculate a laminar flame. So let's look at a turbulent, uh, uh, the situation in, in a turbulent flame. Well, first thing we need to know is we saw before there's a relationship between the turbulent flame speed and the laminar flame speed. So let's just review quickly laminar flame speeds. You notice that laminar flame speeds uh, here, this is in meters per second of room conditions, uh, are all over the map, depending on whether you have a paraffin, olefin, aromatic, or uh, oxygenated fuel. And just to highlight that, if I look at this here, here's methane and here's methanol. So just by um, adding an OH, I basically almost 50% uh, increase in flame speed. So that tells you that chemistry is pretty important because if you look at the, the, the physical properties of these uh, various uh, alkanes or whatever, uh, they don't vary that much. It's the chemistry that's really behind all of this. So <coughs> looking at the uh, chemistry, why is methane flame speed so low? Um, the reason is that, as we discussed when we were talking about methane combustion, after attack by OH or H radicals, uh, you produce the methyl radical, which is a pretty stable species, relatively speaking, uh, before it goes on to produce the formaldehydes, formal and CO and CO2. And so this really explains the uh, difficulty of getting a flame to propagate in a less reactive fuel, such as methane. On the other hand, ethane, which is basically just two C atoms, if you compare <coughs> what goes on over there, uh, and after the H atom is abstracted here, one gets a more uh, reactive species, which eventually leads to uh, the olefin, the, uh, um, the vinyl pathway, uh, which is a relatively fast step. And as a result, the flame speed uh, is much faster. You have much weaker secondary CH bonds. Uh, and this essentially also um, helps in the, uh, these branching pathways involving the catalyst of reaction, namely the hydrogen species. So basically, by looking at the chemistry of the various fuels, you can explain the laminar flame speed to some extent. OK, so that's the reaction part of a reaction diffusion equation. Let's look at the turbulence part. So a typical uh, turbulence model that is widely used is shown here. This is the uh, Reynolds average Navier-Stokes <coughs> RNG K epsilon turbulence model renormalization group turbulence model. Basically, you solve for the turbulence kinetic energy. You have a rate equation, a partial differential equation, and for its dissipation rate. Uh, the terms on the right-hand side involve production. So the production of turbulence is due to the strain uh, of the mean flow, the strain rates. Um, so if you have gradients in the mean flow, you produce turbulence, right? Turbulence kinetic energy. It is dissipated through the dissipation term, and there's also diffusion terms. If you look at the dissipation rate equation, uh, the time scale of the turbulence, remember, was k over epsilon here. Uh, so you have the production times a time scale associated with the dissipation. Uh, there are other terms here. 
involving the renormalization uh, group theory term. There basically is a ratio between the turbulence time scales and the mean flow time scales. But when you're all done with this turbulence model, really the most important thing that's left is this turbulent diffusivity, which depends on the square of the turbulence kinetic energy and the dissipation rate. So one solves these partial differential equations along with the equations of mass, momentum, and energy transfer, the species uh, equations. Uh, and the species and uh, mass and energy mixing is controlled by the turbulent diffusivity, which comes from these equations. How is that turbulence uh, generated? Well, partly due to the intake process. Uh, for example, in this engine here, which is a light duty diesel engine, there is a helical port. The flow comes swirling into this engine here. Again, that leads to high gradients in velocity, which in increase the strain in the fluid, which leads to turbulence production, which leads to the generation of turbulence kinetic energy. Um, so if you were to make a measurement at a point in the combustion chamber, you would see a time varying velocity. Uh, and you could identify structures here with certain time scales. Those time scales would be uh, related to the ratio of K over epsilon. Uh, the length scales of those structures would be those time scales times the velocity, the mean velocity with which they are convected uh, in the flow. And then the magnitude, say the RMS of these fluctuations, would be the turbulence kinetic energy. Okay, so for the reaction diffusion system, it's the turbulent diffusivity that's important. <coughs> but now we have a problem though. We've got, as we saw right at the beginning today, turbulence which scales with the engine speed, that's okay. That we've, we see that in our turbulent diffusivity. But what about the reaction term? We saw that it depends on, on the chemistry. The laminar flame speed depends on the fuel. How do you introduce that into the model? Well, that's an answer that you guys are going to have to provide in your research. Okay? It's an extremely difficult problem. So the way we deal with it is empirically. We devise the, uh, the so-called level set or G equation, which basically tracks the location of the, uh, the flame. Uh, the, uh, the burnt gas is regions where this quantity G is greater than zero. The unburnt gas is regions where the quantity G is less than zero. And the flame itself is located at G equals zero. So basically, this equation is telling you how that surface, G equals zero, is convected around the combustion chamber. So there's some source terms here. Um, the source term on the right involves the turbulent flame speed. So I have to specify that in this model. Until someone has a better theory, I'll show you what we use in a minute, but this is where all of the physics of turbulent flame propagation comes in. There's also a term here involving the curvature of the flame and the turbulent diffusivity. This is generally a relatively small term. This is the main uh, term here. It involves the unburnt gas density, the burnt gas density, and the turbulent flame speed, and then it's a source term for the G equation. So uh, this just shows a movie of a simulation we did in a two-stroke engine. Uh, you see the spark plug spraying and then the flame propagation. Let me just go back uh, here. We're, let's see. Uh, let's see if I can stop this. Okay, so here you see after the spray uh, has evaporated, uh, ignition occurring at the spark plug. We use a model we call the discrete particle ignition model to represent that early stage of combustion. Why do we need this model? Well, remember I mentioned that the mesh size in an engine is at a minimum around a millimeter. Spark plug gap, as you know from playing with your car, if you've ever tried to tune a spark plug gap, is several thousandths of an inch, right? Ten thousandths. Um, so you, you cannot really resolve what's happening in a spark gap in a practical calculation. So instead of trying to do that, we represent the spark process with particles. So these particles, uh, like we are going to do tomorrow with sprays, 
propagate out at a velocity that I'll show you on the next slide. Uh, and behind the group of particles, we have burnt gas, and ahead of them, unburnt gas. When that group of particles has uh, grown, and the radius has grown to be comparable to the size of the turbulent eddies in the simulation, we then switch to the G model, which then does the flame propagation. Notice I also have in this picture here regions where you might have ignition ahead of the flame. When we talk about knock, we'll be discussing uh, how you introduce that as well. Okay, so here's the turbulent flame speed correlation. Uh, this comes from uh, Norbert Peters. Basically, here's our turbulent flame speed. Here's the laminar flame speed. So that's how fuels enter into the uh, turbulent flame. Uh, there are these uh, terms involving a progress term here, uh, and then terms involving the length scale of the turbulence compared to the laminar flame thickness. Constants A, B, and so on that are all listed in Peter's uh, uh, review paper. Okay, so if I look at this equation, I see there's this I0 here. This is a stretch factor that accounts for those early, the early part of the combustion where those particles are propagating out from the spark plug. Uh, there's a significant amount of curvature in the flame front, uh, and that tends to uh, basically reduce the flame propagation velocity due to stretch and curvature effects. So that's in this I0 here. This term here <coughs> is zero at the time of ignition. Um, I'm sorry, is one at the time of ignition. And then this term grows with time after the time of spark. The time scale is our tau again, the characteristic time scale for turbulence. Uh, all right. And as I mentioned to you, once the particles have reached a point where the size of, the, of this field of particles is comparable to the turbulence length scale, we transition then to the G model, which then does the flame propagation. Okay, <clears throat> one other thing is the uh, laminar flame speed. So one way of doing this is to, for your fuel, create libraries of laminar flame speed uh, as a function of temperature, pressure, equivalence ratio, EGR rates, and all the other things that go on in an engine. Uh, a simpler way is to use empirical correlations uh, in the literature. For example, widely used is the metgalchi keck mit model uh, shown here, where the laminar flame speed is determined from as a function of temperature and pressure and the dilution or EGR rate uh, with some constants that depend on the equivalence ratio. Uh, we found that this model here has some limitations because it has a, the potential of going negative speeds for low or high equivalence ratios. So we've introduced this a model that's basically the same but allows you to tail off to positive values of flame speed for low equivalence ratio and high equivalence ratio. So it's an exponential uh, function. In any rate, this is where the laminar flame speed enters that is then inserted in this equation to calculate the turbulent flame speed, which then is entered into the G model as a source term. Okay, so it's kind of a complicated model, right? Uh, it basically has elements of the chemistry through the laminar flame speed. It has elements of the turbulence through the uh, turbulent uh, uh, flame speed. If I go back to that turbulent flame speed, uh, buried in this equation is the turbulent uh, fluctuating velocities, right? Remember, they scale with the piston velocity. So basically, this equation is doing what we said we wanted. We wanted a flame speed that scales with the piston velocity eventually. During the ignition process, chemistry is very important. Once that flame is established and is propagating, this term becomes a constant, and this term dominates the U prime, or the turbulent fluctuating velocity term. Okay, I want to just show you some simulation results, um, just very quickly. Uh, for an engine here, this is for a premixed, uh, or a, a port fuel injected engine, a gasoline engine. I'm also going to show some direct injected engine results, but I'll talk more about these uh, when we discuss sprays. It's a 12 to 1 compression ratio, 89 millimeter bore. 
Uh, and for this port field injected mode, there's several timings, uh, spark ignition timings, uh, for data available to us from a project we had with Ford. Um, so those are the main things I wanted to mention. So here is the port fuel injected homogeneous charge uh, case. Um, here I'm showing you the engine layout. Um, this circular region you see here are those particles in the, the, uh, uh, the particle ignition kernel model. Uh, and soon transitioning to the G model. So here's at five degrees before top dead center. You can see the flame propagating, 10 degrees and 20 degrees. And I have a movie of that here. I think this works. Showing the ignition and the subsequent combustion. Uh, in the movie here, I think we left those particles uh, behind. You can kind of see them there. Let me show this one more time. Uh, you can just barely see them inside the... Uh, domain, just to show the time at which we transition to the G model in this uh, case. Okay, here we see the validation results uh, showing cylinder pressure versus crank angle for different spark timings. And you can see the model does a fairly good job of matching uh, measured cylinder pressure over a wide range of spark timings. Um, this is an interesting slide because on the left, I'm showing you the port fuel injected mode calculation, cylinder pressure versus crank angle, where I'm using the G equation to calculate combustion. I'm also showing you results that you would obtain if you did not have the turbulent flame speed in your model. If instead you only used the turbulent diffusion and the chemical kinetics, and you can see you totally are unable to capture the combustion process. This is what I was alluding to earlier when I mentioned how important it is to have the, the turbulence represented uh, in, your, in your flame speed analysis. The right-hand side shows a direct injected mode. So now instead of injecting the fuel in the intake port, we're injecting directly in the cylinder. And here the gradients are set up by the injected spray. And so now the difference between a, uh, the G equation solution and the kinetics only solution is much less because the turbulence basically is, uh, is it's more like a diffusion flame situation where the uh, turbulence introduced by the spray is what is controlling the combustion process. So depending on what type of engine you're modeling, uh, it's important to notice that flame propagation really requires that you uh, monitor the, the process that involves both the turbulence effect on the, on the species conversion rates and on mixing. Going back to Malad Le Chatelier's uh, analysis. So just to summarize this section then, <coughs> I'm showing pictures in the combustion chamber of the kinetics controlled combustion situation that was not able to match the data and the G equation case where the flame is propagating following the G model. And the conclusion basically is that autoignition chemistry is not sufficient to properly model flame propagation. You need to account for the turbulence enhancing effect on flame propagation. Questions about this material? Um, okay, so going back to the G equation, uh, the velocity field <coughs> is in the background here, all right? That's what's providing the U prime, the, the fluctuating velocities through the turbulence kinetic energy, which is obtained from the K-epsilon model, which depends on production terms from the velocity field. So they're all connected in the CFD. Oh, yeah, so this is the velocity uh, field, yeah. This is the velocity, the convective velocity. So the whole flame can be moving with the mean flow. Mean flow, absolutely, yeah. Yes, that's a good point. Norbert has a, an extension of this model that accounts for basically second order effects. Uh, and one could use that as well, but this is simple enough. Okay, <coughs> yeah. Yeah, this one. So why are the, the two black 
Right, so this is homogeneous charge, okay? And we have flame propagation with our G model, where the flame speed is proportional to the turbulence uh, kinetic energy, square root of the turbulence kinetic energy, or the, uh, the characteristic time scales of turbulence. On the right-hand side, <coughs> we have a, a direct injected engine. So we have a spray that's injected into the engine. That spray is generating turbulence locally and mixing the fuel and the air, all right? And that's what's controlling the combustion process. It's like in a diesel engine where the uh, mixing of the fuel and the air is the rate controlling step rather than flame propagation. So, so that's the difference. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. It's, this was a very early model. You can see here it's 15 years, 14 years old. Uh, there have been improvements where the particles actually move with the local velocity and uh, also the turbulence velocity. And you get uh, essentially elongated flame kernels. Uh, GM and Sandia actually uh, wrote a paper about two years ago that describes that model. Uh, I didn't want to go into that detail here, but yeah, that you, that you can definitely improve on, on this model. The main thing, though, is that you have to have something like this because you're just not able to represent the ion channel between the, the plug electrodes and so on on a practical mesh. You have to have something like this uh, to have a subgrid scale ignition model. Yeah. Sure. In fact, that's uh, something that could be done and probably will be done more and more with parallel computing. But the problem is, let's say you have a region of the mesh with tiny cells and other region with you know, reasonable sized cells. The time steps in the simulation are going to be all controlled by the tiny cell region, which makes your overall computer time still very long. But with parallel computing, you can more or less get around that by having just a whole load of CPUs operating uh, on that fine resolution uh, region. So yes, there are developments that are allowing you to get uh, you know, higher fidelity models. Uh, Got to remember, though, that the audience that we try to attract is industry. All right? And somebody in industry is not willing to wait two months to get the results of one simulation, <laughs> or, one or even a day is uh, like stretching their patience. They want something in two hours. <laughs> and so for that, you have to have a, a simulation that operates on a relatively coarse mesh and still gives you useful results. OK. All right, so uh, what I'd like to do then is to move on to the second part today. So this is where we discuss heat transfer and emissions. And uh, <coughs> I'm not sure how far we're going to be able to get before the next break, but let's see what we can do. So we've had a little bit of discussion about engine heat transfer uh, in the last couple of days. Um, really important, OK? In a conventional diesel engine, as much as 30% of the fuel energy is lost to wall heat transfer. Same is true in a spark ignition engine. Uh, the uh, influence of wall heat transfer has uh, a reach beyond just combustion, uh, or rather heat loss, but also to combustion. It can influence uh, knock processes and so on, and it can actually uh, influence engine dur durability. Uh, we've had disasters in our lab, uh, ranging from relatively minor ones where cracks develop between the valves because of uh, locally high thermal gradients, uh, to cases where uh, basically the piston has participated in the combustion process. <laughs> so, 
students, oh, how come the engine's still running but I don't give it any fuel? Well, it's using the aluminum piston to, to, uh, as fuel. That you can only use a short while. Uh, so you can see these pictures here show the type of damage that can occur due to heat transfer. Um, I cannot spend a huge amount of time discussing heat transfer, but basically the starting point for models is, again, the energy equation. And we've already discussed the combustion source term. Uh, we also have source terms due to the spray that we'll talk about tomorrow. But there's source terms due to radiation that I just want to mention as well today. All right, so that radiation source term uh, basically uh, incorporates the, uh, the radiation flux which is basically at each point uh, you have a solid angle that is receiving radiation from all directions. You have to integrate over that solid angle. And the difference between that and the black body radiation is how you would calculate the source term uh, for the radiation energy trans transport. So looking at wall heat transfer, one approach is to take our equation here and to examine what happens close to the wall. So near the wall, we have a boundary condition that says that the velocity has to be zero at the wall. But we have a boundary layer next to the wall. And we can characterize gradients of velocity by introducing the so-called friction velocity, u star. And I'm sure you're familiar with this from fluid mechanics. We also have a certain dimension that is our resolution, our wall boundary layer cell thickness, delta y. And we can kind of parameterize these two variables by this y plus parameter, which is a non-dimensional length scale, like a Reynolds number that involves u star, the size of the cell, and the viscosity of the fluid. So that's kind of uh, the, the starting point for an analysis. And with that type of analysis, one can determine what the wall heat flux is, or what gradients in temperature close to the wall would look like. And uh, some time ago, uh, Alan Hahn, uh, one of our students, was, uh, came up with this model here, which accounts also for density variation in the fluid in the boundary layer. And instead of the usual law of the wall, where you have basically just the difference between the, the gas temperature and the wall temperature, what he found is it has to be replaced by a logarithmic term. Uh, other than that, though, this looks very similar to the standard law of the wall that you see in a, in a uh, heat transfer textbook. If you include these source terms, like the radiation source term or the combustion source term uh, in this term G here, uh, you see you get an additional term. Uh, so the uh, wall heat flux is influenced by radiation from the media uh, in the combustion chamber. OK, so uh, to calculate radiation, <coughs> one has to track the so-called radi radiation transfer equation, which uh, is shown over here, omega being the solid angle, uh, I here being your radiation intensity. Notice there's no time derivative in this equation, right? This is just uh, spatial derivatives. Stuff travels at the speed of light, right? So we don't need to worry about how it changes with time. Uh, so the terms on the right-hand side are the absorption terms in the medium, the gas, uh, for example, uh, or soot. <coughs> and uh, we also have uh, terms involving extinction and then um, scattering terms. In other words, radiation can scatter off particles in the domain. Generally, the scattering terms can be neglected. Uh, that's usually a good argument show that that is relatively small. And so we're really interested in what happens near the wall. For that, we need to calculate this uh, term G I showed you on the previous slide, the uh, heat flux due to radiation. And for that, I need this uh, quantity I uh, over that's arriving at the wall. And what I do and what we've done in some of our simulations is to use what's called the discrete ordinates method to solve this radiation transfer equation. But basically, instead of having an infinite number of angles in the solid angle here, we only look in a certain number of, of uh, directions, in this case, six directions. 
uh, and we track the radiation transport from cell to cell in our computational domain along those six coordinate directions. You can have more directions, but then the calculation gets more and more expensive. Uh, six turns out to be a reasonable number. So basically, using the discrete ordinates model, you would then uh, sum over the six coordinate directions the radiation intensity from each direction and subtract the black body radiation. Okay, so that's uh, the solution technique, but now we need numbers for these absorption coefficients and extinction coefficients. And so this is where uh, uh, we were discussing earlier the effect of radiation on species. Um, we can essentially look at radiation, the total absorption, as being that from soot and from uh, species in the gas phase, such as CO2 and water and so on. Um, actually, the, uh, the net radiation or the absorption coefficient is often related to the extinction coefficients. You can have an extinction, extinction through the fuel, the CO, the CO2, the water, and so on. So the soot absorption has been correlated in the literature with an equation that you see something like this here, where you basically have the soot concentration and the temperature. For the gas phase species, typically the wideband models are used. This is a model of absorption versus wavelength, uh, and you'll see several peaks here. This data is uh, available in the literature. You can integrate these curves and show, uh, actually, the, typically you see the wideband model represents these curves as a function of, of species, of uh, wavelength. You can integrate over all wavelengths and come up with uh, emissivity for each species. Use that in our emissivity result up here. Relate that to the absorption coefficients. At the end of the day, though, what you find is that overwhelmingly the soot absorption is the most important parameter. The gas phase species, if you do the integration here, their absorption is actually uh, scales with 1 over the temperature, whereas the soot absorption coefficient scales with temperature. So if you go back to your radiation equation here, looking at the uh, radiation source term, you see that uh, basically the uh, dependence on the gas species is t to the 3. All right. Remember, we have the Stefan-Boltzmann constant times t to the 4th here times the absorption coefficients, whereas the soot radiation is proportional to t to the 5th. So that means that you really need to account for radiation from soot. Well, that's not a, a big uh, surprise, because here's a diesel engine. Why are these regions yellow here? That's from the soot radiating, uh, the soot particles, which are at high temperature, radiating out. Uh, and some of that radiation flux is obviously reaching the walls, and that needs to be included in your simulation. OK, so the, this energy arrives at the walls. What happens? Well, in order to go further, you need conjugate heat transfer models. So basically, we need to model the temperature field in the piston uh, that is compatible with the temperature field in the gas phase in the combustion chamber. So basically, we have iterative coupling between what we call the heat conduction in components code, which is a finite element code for the metal part of the engine, and the CFD code, which does the spray and the combustion and so on. So that's our uh, approach. And um, essentially, it's a coupling where we basically use the CFD code, Kiva in this case, with constant wall temperatures. Let's say we, we don't know what they are, but we assume some numbers. We, that gives you a heat flux at the, the surfaces of the uh, combustion chamber. We then use those in the heat conduction and component code to calculate the temperature distribution in the metal, including at the surface surfaces. We then use those surface temperatures back in the CFD code and then continue this in an iterative way until convergence. It turns out that you, know, you can get this done in three or four iterations, so it's not a hugely expensive process. And at the end of the day, you can calculate the temperature distribution uh, in the engine. So this is for the single cylinder oil test engine that we have in the, in the Engine Research Center lab. 
you can see the temperature distribution on the surface of the piston. I'm again just saying, showing you a, segment, a sector of the piston here. This red region is a high temperature region at the corner of the bowl here, which was basically a result of those spray plumes uh, that you saw in this previous picture uh, impinging against the piston bowl, leading to high heat transfer. Um, and here you see another view uh, of the, uh, the layout. In this case, I think this was for a Cummins engine which features valve cutouts. And you can see in the region around the, the raised metal parts of the piston around the valve cutouts, again, very high temperature zones uh, compared to, say, in the rest of the piston. Um, so these results uh, here are kind of interesting because they show the effect of radiation. Um, so let's see. Let's focus first on. Uh, the plot here. This is the peak piston temperature versus start of injection timing. And you notice that as you inject later and later, <coughs> you have less time for heat transfer, so the peak piston temperature decreases. Um, so without radiation, we have these solid uh, symbols here. This would be when we assume a certain temperature everywhere on the surfaces of the piston and uh, the head and liner. After the first iteration, we get this prediction of the peak uh, piston temperature. And then after a second iteration, we get this one in the middle. So basically, we're converging to somewhere in between those two. And you can see that the piston temperatures, let's say for early injection, are on the order of 620 Kelvin peak temperature. Um, so this was with no radiation. With radiation, we get these curves shown here. It's the same thing. The first was our first approximation, the second, and then the, the third calculation in the middle. And now you see temperatures that are on the order of 690. So 70 degrees difference in peak piston temperature due to radiation. And in fact, if you look at the heat loss, you see it's increased by about 30% due to radiation in this conventional diesel engine operating at high load operating point. 34% uh, of the increase is on the head, 19% on the liner, this part here, and then 47% on the piston. So this has actually a significant effect also on emissions because the radiation is transferring the energy to the walls, which is cooling the gases in the combustion chamber. And that results in a reduction in NOx. So here it's NOx versus start of injection timing. If you look at the data, you, you can see that the NOx is reduced by as much as 30% because of the effect of radiation, which is kind of interesting. We've been looking also at low temperature combustion regimes and uh, looking at heat flux. Uh, here we see an experimental setup that uh, Eric Ingrich did in his master's work recently. Uh, it's a single cylinder uh, version of a GM 1.9 liter diesel engine, uh, compression ratio 16 to one, uh, some of the details of the engine are shown here. Um, basically, the engine was installed with a conventional diesel injector in, in, this, in the single cylinder that was studied, as well as two port fuel injectors. And we, this, we did this to allow a lot of flexibility in the combustion strategies that were explored. So, for example, we can run conventional diesel by having just the, the direct injected diesel. Or we can run HCCI by turning off the diesel injection and having port fuel injection, perhaps of two fuels, of PRF fuel, for instance, one would be isooctane and one would be n-heptane. And by blending those two, we can create combustion timings of interest. Alternatively, we can have all three injectors operating. And we can generate uh, port fuel injected low reactivity fuel and direct injected high reactivity fuel and look at the reactivity controlled compression ignition that I mentioned before. So it's a very versatile experimental setup. Details of the injectors and so on are shown here. The standard diesel common rail and standard port fuel injectors. So what uh, Eric did was to instrument the piston with thermocouples uh, at the seven locations that you can see here. Uh, and actually, I'm going to focus only on the results from the bowl thermocouple three and the 
thermocouple above the squish, in the squish region above the piston. This was a telemetry system where basically the signals from the thermocouples were transferred to uh, data collection outside the engine. And the whole thing was powered by inductive uh, power uh, due to the piston motion. All right, so the thermocouple data uh, is available as a function of crank angle, and it's fit with a Fourier uh, analysis. If you use this temperature data, you can then calculate heat flux. Uh, and the heat flux actually has two contributions. One is the steady state heat flux. To evaluate this, you need not only the temperature at the wall, but some temperature, some distance into the wall so that you can calculate uh, the conduction term, the steady conduction term. Uh, of more interest to us was this term, which is the time varying contribution or the dynamic contribution to the heat flux. Okay, so as I said, uh, we looked at several combustion modes, conventional diesel, HCCI, and RCCI. There's a lot of data in his uh, SAE paper, but I'm just gonna show data for a couple of conditions. Mode three here is um, uh, 2,300 RPM, 5.7 bar. Uh, we made sure to keep the combustion timing um, similar for each of these combustion strategies. The fuels were for HCCI uh, from those two port injectors. Uh, we used uh, gasoline mixed with N-heptane to make sure that ignition occurred at the corresponding uh, timing to give us CA50 as described. For diesel, we used uh, NATO F76 diesel fuel. This is a standard fuel used in the Navy. Uh, and then for RCCI, we used the diesel fuel uh, for the reactive fuel, and then for the port injected fuel, gasoline. So this shows the heat release from the combustion process determined from the pressure trace for this one operating point here. Uh, and as you can see, uh, for the conventional diesel shown in uh, red here, we have a fairly high heat release rate. For the HCCI, very short combustion duration, high heat release rate. For the RCCI, as we'll be discussing more when we talk about low temperature combustion regimes, you are able to control the combustion phasing. So we have phasing and duration, so we have a much uh, lower peak heat release. So this has an effect on the heat transfer. Remember location three was in the bowl, location seven was above the piston. If you now compare the, uh, the heat flux okay, uh, against crank angle, you can see that for the uh, red, the conventional diesel, we have very high heat flux in the bowl. Uh, for the HCCI, intermediate levels, and for the RCCI, relatively low heat flux. Uh, for the uh, location seven, this is in the squish region, the diesel and the HCCI are similar. Uh, but again, the RCCI is relatively low heat flux. This just summarizes uh, for those other engine operating conditions. Um, we just looked at mode three, but we, over a wide range of operating conditions. And in all cases, the diesel uh, heat flux uh, is uh, much higher than that corresponding to the um, homogeneous charge or RCCI uh, cases for both uh, locations. So we've also done the same type of analysis for heavy duty diesel engines, comparing conventional diesel and RCCI combustion. And this just show, shows some results from Terry Hendricks's uh, paper. Uh, and the comparisons shown here show significant differences in the distribution of temperatures on the piston measured through these, uh, uh, these uh, telemetry thermocouple systems between conventional diesel and RCCI. And in particular, with this RCCI combustion, much lower surface temperatures. So what's the implication of that? Well, if you integrate the uh, heat flux calculated from the thermocouple data over the whole piston, you find that as a percentage of the fuel energy, RCCI has much lower heat loss. And when we talk about engine efficiency a little later, we'll see that this has a significant effect because it allows you to essentially improve the gross indicated efficiency or the work output from the engine significantly. And in fact, here you see we're gaining an extra 
1.5% in gross thermal efficiency because of these differences in heat transfer or heat loss. Okay, so I'm going to uh, take our next break, and when we get back, we're going to talk about emissions. Before that, though, any burning questions? Yeah. The temperatures on the, the heat. Um, are you seeing the same temperature drop in the salt tips? That's a good question. So with low temperature combustion, you have lower exhaust temperatures because you've had a lot of charge dilution. And I'll get into that in more detail. Yeah. Okay, so we're back in 15 minutes, right? 11.15.